as we continue in our series on the book of Daniel. And uh, Daniel has been an incredible uh, journey for us, and we're in chapter 4. I encourage you, if you have your Bibles, to open up to chapter 4. We're going to get through 4 and just kind of touch on 5 today. And um, as we, we look at Daniel, one of the things that we've seen is, is that there have been a lot of situations and circumstances where people have gone through difficult, cir- difficult things. And how is your faith going to respond in the middle of dir- difficult circumstances? But not all things in life are difficult, right? Have you ever noticed that there are some things in life that are really good? Uh, that there are some moments in life where we have significant success in our life? And what we're going to look at today is how do, we handle, how do we handle responding to God in the midst of success? How do we, when things are going well, how do we respond to God? Because I'll tell you this, as a pastor and I've been walking with people over for many, many years, that a lot of people tend to have the hardest time with God when things are going the easiest. That it's easy to say, well, I'm kind of doing good. Do I really need God? <laughs> Is God really needed? And then when things are bad, then we're like, oh, Jesus, I need you. You know, like there's this internal panic that kind of comes over. And what we're going to do today is we're going to look at Nebuchadnezzar and, and Belshazzar, who is the leader who follows Nebuchadnezzar in, in the Chaldean Empire. And those two guys, and we're going to look at them in contrast to Daniel. Now, one just little side note, just as you're reading through Scripture, just remember that Daniel kind of gets his name changed to Belteshazzar, and then the other leader's name is Belshazzar, and sometimes they can get confusing, but they're two different people, okay? So just kind of keep that in mind just as you're reading when you notice those two little pieces. But here's the thing about Nebuchadnezzar. Let me talk about him for a second. Nebuchadnezzar was at the pinnacle, at the absolute height of a self-made person. He was considered one of the greatest leaders in all of history. If you look back on historical connection of, his, of, of empires and movements, Nebuchadnezzar is at the top of every list. This guy was a political and economic and a military genius. I, this, he, did, he was not holding a small candle next to anyone. He had the capacity, had the mental capacity, he had the fortitude of strength. Um, this guy was confident of confidence. Uh, he, he, he was one of those guys, even on the military side, he didn't armchair quarterback from the back and send people in to do the fighting. He was the guy in the first chariot, the first one at the battle lines. He understood what was at stake and why he was building the empire that he was building. By the end of his reign, he had conquered the known world. The known world that he knew, there were some outlying areas and the Persians will come in afterwards and kind of build afterwards. But in this time period, there was no other army that could compare to his. There was no threat. There were not even little raiding skirmish parties that bothered him. And what he built was the city of Babylon. And Babylon is in modern day Iraq. It was where it was. And it was the largest global city ever built. What I mean by that is the percentage of the world population, that the largest per- to ever live in one city was Babylon. The largest percentage of the global population was in Babylon. It was a massive city for its time for the population of the earth. And Nebuchadnezzar built it. So much so that his wife really wanted, his, really wanted a beautiful view out the palace window. And what she was hoping for more than anything was a mountain view. And uh, so he built a mountain. He had a mountain built so it would, it would enhance where they looked. Like most of us were like, I'd love a lake house someday. That'd be great to have a lake house. And so we looked for property on a lake. No, not Nebuchadnezzar. I'm just going to wipe out everybody else's house and build a lake right there. You know, this is where I'm going to be and, and I'm going to move those things around. The walls that surrounded Babylon by ancient historians were, were rumored to be, and most of them don't believe it because of how tall they talked about, 80 feet tall in spots and, and other areas that were just overwhelming. But we know from archaeological digs, we found spots well over 40 feet tall on a regular basis. It was wide enough that they could race four chariots side by side in races around the top of it. An impenetrable fortress, which ends up being the downfall to the next leader. But we'll hear a little bit more about that maybe next week and dig into that. But one of the pieces, too, is that um, he also created what was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. They were beautiful. They, they, he built a, the city became a park. Uh, the city became a forest. It just was beauty everywhere. Everywhere you looked, it was immense, and it was gorgeous, and it was incredible, and it was massive and filled with people and gold. And he built it all. 
He had no equals. He had no rivals. He had no one to threat. He had no worries. I, I think if social media were in that day, Nebuchadnezzar would have been the king of Instagram and the king of selfies, right? He would have just been walking around going, hey, here I am. That's my wall. You know, and he's just like, there it is. Hey, here I'm, I hear I'm at the gardens. Hashtag beautiful, just like my bae. You know, he's got all of his little things that he's, he's going and he's building and he's hashtagging it. And he, and he would have been deserved in every comment he made. Because he was a very proud man. He, he would have had millions of likes on every post and it, because he deserved it. it really, he, he had this deserved sense of pride. However, understanding pride and its impact on us is a key element in our lives. To, to understand how pride does something deep within us. In fact, by the end of today, I want to put sermon in kind of a sentence. We're going to look at it this way. That we will either allow pride to harden us or we allow God's presence to humble us. There's only one of two options. Either in life, pride will harden our hearts, or God's presence will humble us. See, one of the greatest tests in life is when things are going well. So when things are going good, uh, then when we are successful, when we're smart, you see, even, even in this time period, God allowed the destruction or the capture of Jerusalem, but not everybody had it all terrible. By this point, all right, um, Daniel's doing well. Daniel's in this position of leadership, things he has, he has been raised in, in capacity. People saw how good he was at things. He found incredible success as he was underneath Nebuchadnezzar. But what we want to see is how the two men's lives differed really in the midst of their success. Because one thing that's absolutely clear is that nobody is exempt from pride's consequences. And it doesn't matter who we are, because that's, that's the deceptive piece of pride, is that, well, It'll happen to those people, but not me. All right, it'll happen to someone else. In fact, it's what I want to encourage you today. Today's going to be one of those days where normally it's really easy just to go, you know, if this person would just hear that message today, if that person at work would hear this message today, if my wife would just listen to the message today, right? It's, don't do that today. Today, focus solely in going, I need to hear this from me. I need to listen to this from me. God, what are you saying about me and my life? Because here's one of the true things about pride is, is, and the consequences of pride, is that pride is the primary cause of sleepless nights. Let's, let's look at verse 4. Daniel 4, verse 4. It says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was living in my palace in comfort and prosperity, but one night I had a dream that frightened me. I saw visions that terrified me as I lay in my bed. I mean, here, here was a guy who had everything that he needed. He didn't need anything, and yet he was tormented at night. He had everything before him that he needed, and yet anxiety was in him. He, he felt overwhelmed. He still felt fearful. It doesn't matter where you are in life, you can still feel that anxiety, still feel that sense, still lose sleep over certain things. And the dream that he had was a frightening dream to him. He had this dream of this beautiful, amazing tree that grows up in the center of all things and it produces life and life came underneath it. And, and it was this magnificent, incredible vision. And then he hears a voice from heaven say, cut the tree down. And the tree is chopped down and, and dispersed and gone. But what's left, he says, but the voice said, leave the root and the stump. And he's terrified. He wakes up in a cold sweat. And you start to realize that no matter how accomplished you think you might be, you're never going to be complete. Have you ever heard the thought, well, if I just hit that next pay grade, I, I think everything would change in our life. If I, if I just had my, this happen in my life, then everything would change. And the truth is, it doesn't matter what level you attain, you're never going to be complete. In fact, they've done studies after studies of the ultra-wealthy, you know, the, several of the people that make more than all of us combined, multiply it by um, multiple times on top of that. And what they found in, the, in the, those lives, even though on the outside they would never say these things, that internally they were greatly troubled, that almost all of them are on sleep prescription medication in order to help them sleep through the night. Because they can't, they can't shut the brain off. They can't stop thinking about all the things that they have and what might lose and what might they, somebody else might come and take. And, and here's the understanding of that. Because when your soul longs for something big, 
When you're the type of person who wants something big in your life, you want something meaningful in your life, you will work and you will claw and you will pursue it. You will pour empires of effort into getting that and making it happen in your life. But when you achieve it, what you do is you realize when you get there that you're still longing for something. There's still something that you're longing for. Even though you've achieved everything, you've poured out everything to get because success cannot satisfy or complete you. It just is, it, it can't. And so finally Daniel's called to the king because he just is overwhelmed by this dream. And he asks him to give, the, give counsel, to give an interpretation. And, and Daniel's afraid to give it, but this is what Daniel tells him in verse 24. He says, this is what your dream means, your majesty. And what the Most High has declared will happen to the Lord, my king. You, are, you will be driven from human society. And you will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow. And you will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn what the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. But the stump and the roots of the tree will be left in the ground. This means that you will receive your kingdom back again when you have learned that heaven rules. If you underline things in your Bible, I'd encourage you to underline this next phrase. He says, but King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. Because, King, even you and the incredible magnificence you are in your mind and your capacity and what you've achieved and what you've accomplished, even you will be cut down. Even you are not immune to pride's consequences. You cannot stand on your own. You are going to have to learn that you are not the one one in charge. That's the allure of pride. The allure of pride is that I can control things. That if I just bark loud enough or if I just stand confident enough, if I just lead well enough, if I just take control of our finances well enough, if I just stand in the, that I can control things. All of us have probably, you've sat on committees, whether it's, you know, kind of fundraising committee for this organization for your kids, or you're in a committee at work, or a task force, or something, or with other people, and you're watching everyone trying to control something. (laughs) If I just do this, then I'll get control and do things the way that I want to do. But but control is out of our grasp. Proverbs 16.5 says this, it says, the Lord despises pride. You can be sure that the proud will be punished. See, pride is what caused Adam and Eve to fall. It's the original sin. It is at the heart of everything evil that happens in our world. Everything that you see around you, here in the news, pride is at the core of it. Every tension-filled moment in your life, when you walk into a situation and there's tension between other people, pride is at the core of it. And we have got to understand that we are not immune to it. There's not a person in this room that is immune to the consequences of pride. We're all going to deal with it. We're all going to wrestle with it. One of the things about pride is, it, is complacency will step in as a result of pride, and success can step in as a result of pride, or we've done good work, and it will harden our hearts. Complacency and success tend to be the two things that harden our hearts more than anything. Nebuchadnezzar received this warning, and like most people in the clutches of pride, what does he do? Not me. He ignores it, right? It's not, it's not for me. That's, that means for somebody else is going to have an issue, but not myself. It won't happen to me because that's what happens. We get complacent and we get successful. And look what it says in verse 28. But all these things did happen to King Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, 12 months later, he was taking a walk on the flat roof of the royal palace. How long later? This is a year later. Daniel gives him a warning Nothing changes one year later. Then finally, as he looked across the city, he looks at it and he says, look at the great city of Babylon. Selfie time, right? Hey, look at the great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. So here's what pride does. Pride causes you to say, I did it. Therefore, I'm do it. I did it. Therefore, I'm I am, do it. It's it's due to me. Tim Keller puts it this way. He says, life is by me, and as a result, it's for me. I've worked harder. I've worked smarter. I've been more intelligent. I've put in more hours. I've put in more effort than other people, so therefore, I am owed what I have, 
are those that are very successful. It tends to be the vocabulary. I've worked very hard. I put in the 90-hour weeks. I put in the time. I put in the, 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 the debt at school to get extra schooling and all those kind of things. Look at all that I've done. I am owe it. I'm, it's due to me. I, I get it back. And not only is it successful people that think that way, but even oppressed people deal with things in the same manner. Except depress, depress, oppressed people, sorry, kind of put it in a little different framework. And they will say, I've suffered more than anyone else. I've paid the penalty more than anyone else. I've sacrificed more than anyone else. Therefore, I'm do it. Look at all that I've had happen against me. Look at all the, short, the, the things that have come against my life. Therefore, I'm do it. And each of us are going to wrestle with this warning sign that we have to see glaring in it. I deserve more than I'm getting. I deserve more than I'm getting. I deserve more respect than I'm getting. I deserve more attention than I'm getting. I deserve more pay than I'm getting. I deserve more relationships than I'm getting. I deserve more than what I'm getting. Why? Because it's due me. It's due me. I a couple years ago, a little over a decade ago, there was a, a Ponzi scheme that rattled most of Minnesota. And you, know, you hear about Ponzi schemes occasionally every once in a while, right? Where, where people say they promise big returns on your investment. That if you give to this, then you're going to get this much back. Everybody else kind of gets a little bit increased, but you're going to get mad, like three times the increase. And, and what happened with this particular Ponzi scheme, which made it even more devastating, is the majority of the victims of the Ponzi schemes were Christians. And what, it, what happened with this particular one is there are a lot of Christian organizations and, and Christian leaders that heard pe- them, the sales pitch went like this. You've sacrificed for the kingdom of God for a long time. You're due God's blessing. That you, you're due God's blessing. This is God's blessing back to you. Right? This is because you've sacrificed and you've given so much. And so all these organizations were giving money to this other, and they were just taking their money and then paying back this group an amount and paying back this group an amount. But Ponzi schemes, eventually, the money doesn't add up and, and it falls apart and prison time happened and all those things. But yet all these people with good intentions for kingdom work and business for the, for the kingdom of God, and, and they say, we sacrificed it. We gave this up for the God, for God's kingdom. We've worked to give to other people. We are due the blessing. And we can see how subtle pride can come in in every different area and how it can make us to think we deserve more than we're getting. But Tim Keller, he puts it this way. He says, pride is the ultimate act of cosmic plagiarism. That it's the ultimate act of cosmic plagiarism because we claim to be the author of what ultimately was a gift to us. We claim to be the author of our lives, the author of what was been created, but ultimately it's a gift from God. Look at 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For what gives you the right to make such a judgment? What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it were not a gift? So when we feel it's due to us, when we, it just ends up hardening us. Hardens our heart because we figure, oh, I deserve this. I deserve it. It shouldn't be such a difficult thing in my life. I deserve what I have and what's happening. I deserve better than what I'm getting. For me, share the story of us a couple, several, long time ago, <laughs> when we went through some financial struggles. And I'll be very honest, the whole concept of tithing during that time period became very difficult for me. That I, I end up really wrestling with God over the concept of, of tithing because I was like, God, I am being obedient to you. And in my obedience to you of taking a step of faith, I took a pay cut and I took this. And now I'm in debt, all these other, because the market changed and the economy changed and my house value collapsed and all those things. God, wouldn't it be better for me to not take that 10% and just put it back towards getting us out of the hole so that we can do better for you in the future? And I remember wrestling with that. Should that be? And all the time going, oh, every week I'd write the a tithe check and we would write, send it in. And I'd go, but, but don't I deserve more? Don't I deserve better? And it wasn't until God kind of helped me understand, no, Brian, everything you have is a gift. I'm responsible for all of it. And as I kept writing and realizing even, it kind of like realizing, let's say you have medical bills that pile up and you go to a friend or some family member and say, I, I need $10,000 to help pay this off. Could, could I, can I borrow $10,000? And they're like, absolutely. Here's $10,000. And guess what? You only have to pay 1000 back. Only pay 1000 back. 
I think most of us would go, that's amazing. I can't believe that. You paid off all the debt and I only have to pay you a thousand back in, in return. That's, that's kind of what God does with us. Right? He's saying all of it's mine. All of it's a gift to you. Hey, show that you trust me and just the 10% and we'll use that to bless other people and go other, multiply what God has in, in, for them and what he has for them and what pride stands in opposition to. And really at the end of the day, if we're going to say what this message is about, it's not about pride. Today's message is truly about humility. Because what humility is, is a receiving posture where I understand that everything I have is a gift. That everything I have is a gift that the presence of God has given me. And I need to learn to receive everything with joy. And I can receive it with joy, receive it with confidence. You see, you have two guys, you have Nebuchadnezzar and, and actually Belshazzar, Bel, Belshazzar and, and compared to Daniel. All three successful have a lot. The significant difference is how they received it who they acknowledged as the owner of the gift, who they acknowledged as the author of the gift. Because pride, the other piece, again, remember, everything is owed me. Everything is due me. It hardens our heart. We have a hard time really receiving from other people. And as a result, it ends up isolating and really actually bringing confusion to relationships. Pride will bring confusion to your relationships. Have you ever, you ever wondered why you have things at work like you work with somebody you're like man we should be on the same page on this but we are just not connecting this is different and it's so frustrating you have any friends that you have at school or in life and you're just going man we are just clashing right now what is happening or at home it's almost always pride because when pride is is in that moment this is why it's, I'm, I'm saying don't look at them right now let's just say okay god what about me in this moment Pride is almost the, always the one bringing confusion to the relationships. Because look what happens to King Nebuchadnezzar, verse 31. While these words were still on his mouth, it's him proclaiming, look at all the beautiful things I've done, selfie, hey, you know, like hashtag I'm awesome, right? He, after he says that, a voice from heaven calls down, O King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass and you will live this way until you learn that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. That the same hour, the ju that same hour a judgment was fulfilled and Nebuchadnezzar was driven from human society. All right, confusion comes in, driven away from society, driven away from his kingdom. He ate grass like a cow. He was drenched with the dew of the heaven and he lived this way until his hair was as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird claws. Nebuchadnezzar gives us this extreme example of what pride does to our soul. And what God is saying, you wanted to think of yourself as more than human? You need to understand that pride will make you less than human. You think you're better than everyone else? And God's saying, I will help you understand that you deserve nothing. And in that moment, what we see in this example is just three quick things that I want us to, to look at. Is that we become like an animal that we lose a sense of our humanity when we allow pride to lead. And like an animal, we, we become, pride helps us unable to exhibit empathy. We're not able to exhibit empathy with pride. And some people are going like, well, no, but animals have empathy. My dog like cuddles up to me every time I'm sick. All right, okay, okay, dogs don't have empathy. We'll get this. They, have my, they, they, they want food. And they know you're the provider of food and you don't do well right now, so you, therefore, they want to make sure you will feed them. <laughs> See, because here's the re empathy requires imagination. Animals don't have imagination. Imagination is required, and it's an artistic gift that God gives us to allow us to picture what it would be like from another person's perspective. How can we walk? How can the other person be feeling right now? What are they sensing? What are they going through? What is it that their life would look like for all the things that they're experiencing? True empathy allows me to put myself in their perspective, feel what they feel, own what they own, care for what they care for, be passionate at what they're passionate about. Most of the time in our world, we have a lot of people that talk about empathy, but what they're really talking about is sympathy and pity. They're really talking about sympathy and pity. Oh, I feel bad for you that you're not as good as me. Justice should step in and allow you to be as good as me. That's not empathy. That's pity. 
And in these moments, we have to understand that, that pride will remove empathy from us. It won't allow us to really connect with other people. The other thing that drive, pride does is it isolates us. Pride will isolate yourself and because ultimately, when it, you are feeling threatened that somebody else might be smarter, better, stronger, or have things in, a, in more perspective than you do, that you don't want to be around them because it hi- highlights the fact that you're not at the top of the pecking order like you thought you were. And here's, here's the, the thing. Even Nebuchadnezzar had to come to grips, even though he was at the top of every pecking order, intellectually, financially, power, influence. God had to help him see there's always someone higher than you. And that was him. It will isolate you. This is, one of the reasons we avoid small groups is we don't want other people to know that we might be vulnerable. Right? That, that my kids might not be as good as I make them look on Instagram. You know, that my life might not be as together as I want people to think, that I might not be maybe as, as sharp as other people might think that I am, that, that my, my ability to fake it might eventually be found out. But the beautiful thing about God and why humility is so important is that God wants in the midst of our vulnerability, God still loves us. He still cares for us. He doesn't worry about us. And so like an animal, we, pride drives us to have a survival instinct. They won't see me cry. Because if you want to rest, know, do you really wrestle with pride or not? I'm going to ask you this. Who has permission to speak deeply into your life? Who has permission to call you out on something in a, in a way that you won't rise back up? That you go, yeah, I don't know if I want to be around them too much later. You know, I'm going to figure out a different schedule so they're not in my life anymore. Who has that permission? Because all of us need somebody in our life that can call us out, not just on our actions, but the, on, on the intentions of our heart, on, on the categories of our surrender to God. Who can speak to you that way? It's, it's man, I, I want to talk to you just for a second. All right, because this is why a lot of times we don't worship or why we, we struggle, why a lot of times guys struggle with faith things more so, because it's, you have to be vulnerable. When you worship, when you're, you're saying is, God, you are the creator, you are above all things, and for someone else to look on the outside and see me do that, that's a little awkward. And so I'll just, you know, stand and watch for a little bit, and that'll be good. And I'm like, no, I don't really worship that way. I'm like, well, I'll put most of us in a football game or watching a game at home and, yeah, like there's a moment you will raise your hands and show a little excitement over some things. And when we can identify the fact that God is the source of all things and we can be vulnerable enough to let other people see and know that I, this is not about me. I am, I am convinced that even though I've got a lot going for me, that this is not about me. I think he is above all things and, and has permission to speak into my life. And the final thing that it does that we see with Nebuchadnezzar is pride will make us incapable of possessing joy. Right, again, animals don't possess joy. People are like, no, they do. They love me and they lick my face and it's awesome. <laughs> and they're sweet. Again, they want to eat. Um, <laughs> but see, true joy is this. True joy is that you can have joy in the midst of suffering. Animals don't have the capacity to have joy in the midst of suffering. And God reduces Nebuchadnezzar to a level below human to help him understand, you think you're greater than everyone else? Let me show you what pride really does is it actually reduces you from what I've created you to be. To be able to have joy in the midst of suffering, to even when trouble hits, that you can rejoice and be fully anchored and satisfied. So even though we're talking about joy, what I really want you to do by the time that we, in the next few moments, is that you go into this week and understand that pride will keep you up for a while, right? Nebuchadnezzar lived on pride for decades. He was at the top and the pinnacle, but eventually it found him out. And that, that the only sustainable posture is humility. The only posture that can sustain you to produce what you want to have produced in your life is a posture of humility. Because eventually pride will break you, pride will isolate you, pride will keep you from having a good night's sleep, you'll you'll have instinctual responses, anger will kick in, eventually pride will break you down. Because if you don't, but if you want to have a life filled with purpose and joy and love, the only posture is humility. Verse 34 it says, after this time had passed, 
the seven seasons, okay, the seven time periods. And just, to, just so you know that we don't know for sure exactly what that is. It could have been seven months or probably seven seasons. So up, just a little under two years would probably be about the amount of time that this was. It says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked to heaven. My sanity returned, and I praised and worshiped the Most High. And I honored the one who lives forever. He finally gets it. His heart is broken. He's restored to the completeness of who God has for him. It says his rule is everlasting and his kingdom is eternal. All the people of the earth are nothing compared to him. He does as he pleases among with the angels of heaven and among the people of the earth. No one can stop him or say to him, what do you mean by doing these things? When my sanity returned to me, so did my honor and the glory and my kingdom. And my advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored as the head of my kingdom with even greater honor than before. But now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All of his acts are just and true, and he is able to humble the proud. See, in the vision, God cut him down to a stump. But what I love about God is no matter how low you are cut, he always leaves what is needed in life to grow back. He always leaves the capacity for mercy to come in and restore you. He didn't uproot him completely, but he did allow his heart to be broken. And what I want to end with is just a couple things as we go into this week. How do we live in a posture of humility? To avoid the consequences of of, of pride, how do we live in the posture of humility? And we see this in Nebuchadnezzar's prayer. And the first is exalt and glorify God and God alone. We need to live continually exalting him. Compared to the creator of the universe, I can do nothing. Right At the end of the day, I can look at my life and look at all the places I've been and the accolades I've I've developed and all the pieces I've done, but can I, at the will, at my will, make the moon change its orbit one little bit? You know, I can take all these things and I can put on myself and I say, look at how good I am. And then God goes, oh, that's awesome. Grand Canyon, you know. Like, look at all the things I've built and all the influence I have and I can speak and people, people listen and goes, God, that's great. The sun, you know. Like, who he is is so much more than anything that we could ever be or compare to. And this is how Daniel lived his life. This is why Daniel was able to keep this posture of humility throughout his entire life, even though he continued to have success upon success. Daniel never saw what he did as his own. He always saw everything as glorifying God, exalting God, knowing God, lifting him up above all things. You have got to understand, you are not a random act of of the universe that will put you together and, and you are who you are and then what you did with it was up to you. You are a work of art knit together by a creator for a purpose and, and, a, and an intentionality to bring hope and life through you. And that that creator has knit you together and used you. And as, a, as you are coming back to the creator saying, thank you for being amazing. Thank you for noticing me. And that's why you can live then with and recognize that you live life in a receiving posture. You recognize everything in life as a gift that God gives you. Well, one of the ways I like to think about it is can you live life palms up? In fact, I'd like for you to just do that just for a second. Just, just put your palms like this, right? And, and what it is, it's a receiving posture. In this moment, now, if somebody can give you something and you can just hold it, and then if they want to take it away, that they can take it away. Now, the problem is what tends to happen is somebody gives us something, especially they give us a little money, and we like to do this, <laughs> and we like to close the fist around it. And, oh, it's mine. But when we learn to live with palms open, saying I'm receiving. Everything I have is a gift. Everything I have is a reception from who God has, that that I'm grateful for it. After this, in in chapter 5, Nebuchadnezzar does pass away, and and the new leader, Belshazzar, Belshazzar, comes in place. And later on, in decades past, he has a banquet. And and in this banquet, it's just a a horrific, horrible um, display of decadence and, and ego and, and sexuality and all kinds of things that kind of what's being in play. And he wanted to show the world he was the one that was in power. He's starting to hear rumbles of this Persian empire starting to emerge from a distance. And, and he wanted to really recognize how good he was. And in the middle of the party, God has had enough 
And it says the hand of God comes down into the middle of the party and takes a finger and starts writing on the wall. I'm telling you, that is a party wrecker right there, right? Like, you're just having a good old time, little club. You know, you're just dancing. And, and all of a sudden, the finger of God is just carving up the drywall, right? They didn't know what to do, but his, his, his mom says, I, there's this guy, Daniel, who lives with an incredible reputation, who has always had the capacity to hear and know and discern what's happening. And so Daniel's called in and, and he says, King, you knew all about Nebuchadnezzar's madness. You knew that he had not humbled himself. And yet you have not humbled yourself either. For you have proudly defiled the Lord of heaven and have made the cups from the temple before you. See, what he did is he took all the things that were holy from God's temple that Nebuchadnezzar had stolen and were taken, and they started using them as, part, as party implements. So they're taking things that have been holy to God, and they're just using them casually as they have prostitutes and other people in the room, and they're using these things that were beautiful before God. It says, you and your nobles, your wives, your concubines have been drinking wine from them while praising gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Gods that neither see nor hear nor know anything at all. But you have not honored the God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. What God wrote on the wall is that your days are numbered, you have been weighed, and your kingdom will be divided. You have been plagiarizing from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and he's calling you on account. You have been claiming that what you did was for you. So one of the things I would encourage you to do this week, and it'll take some time, but at some point during the week, take a journal, take a phone, take a notepad, take your computer, take your iPad, whatever. I want you to take some time with this. But just start writing everything that is good about your life. Write down all of it. Write down everything that you have, that, that's, that's ama- your relationships, um, your capacity. And if you're a good leader, write down your leadership skills. If you're good with people, your ability to connect and relate with people. If you're a good, you know, if you're a good parent, how you're a good parent. If you're a good baker, just stop right there and praise the Lord that you have that capacity. You know, like if you're a good cook, you know, like just, just write everything down that you are good at, that you enjoy, that you have been blessed with. And then take that list and one by one, bring it to God and thank him for it. Say, God, thanks for this. Thanks to you've given me the ability to do this. Thanks for allowing me to do this. Because when we do this, we're able to serve others with gratitude and respect. The, the, the thing that made the difference in Nebuchadnezzar's life, Daniel had told him, King, repent from your sins and serve the poor. Every penny you make, every relationship you have, every material possession you own, recognize it as a work of art that God has done in you and see the beauty in it And the more you do that, the more you're going to want to serve others. See, we tend to think humility is like cower and and, and hide in a corner. But humility is not thinking less of yourself. True humility is just thinking about yourself less. I just don't think about me as much because I'm good. Everything I have is a gift so I can give it away. Everything I have is beautiful so I can give it away. See, see, you never need to chase respect. If you live an honorable life, respect will find you. You never need to chase success. If you live an honorable life and do the most with what God has placed within you. Remember, I'm not saying be lazy. or be, No, no. I mean, you give everything you have. God's given you a gift to lead. I mean, you pour into that. God's given you the ability to work hard, to be a craftsman at things. You pour into that. Why? Because it's his gift. And you do it to honor him. And if you do it that way, those things will come. God will put the right things in place. Daniel never had to manipulate his way into power. All he had to do was live an honorable life and respect found him. Ultimately, what King Nebuchadnezzar learned and what King Belshazzar did not learn is that you do have to confess your sins and allow your heart to break. Back in, in verse 27, the cure was to look at those who are suffering, give them life, give financially, give joyfully to others, and allow worship to rise from your heart. See, when you allow worship to rise from your heart, it puts everything else in perspective. 
or the way I kind of think and the way I approach life for people that don't know me, that maybe don't have a relationship with God to come in and watch what happens on a platform on Sunday mornings. They're like, that's weird. Maybe he's a little odd. And there might be some truth to that. But I'm just telling you, I make so many different choices about my life because I've come to understand that I need to surrender to God in everything. Either what he says is true or it's not. And if what he says is true, then he is the creator of all things. He's the one that knits all things together. He's the one that puts all things in place. And I have no business thinking highly of myself in a way that would confront him. That I can worship him and I can praise him and I can give him glory in every moment. In fact, there's an old saying that I think there's so much truth in it that it says a man on his faith, as his face can never fall from that position. If you live a life where pride and ego is continually trying to get you one up over other people, eventually you're going to fall. But if you live your life in humility before God, you can never fall from the position. Daniel ends up at the end of this story, second in command over all the known world. Why? Over decades of service, over multiple leaders and, and regime changes. How did he do that? Because he's on his face before God. Because he was humble before his king. We, like Nebuchadnezzar, sometimes just need to have something shift in our life and confess and allow God to take away our sins. See, pride causes us to think that we are more than human. We deserve more than other people. We should get more than other people. I'm due more than other people. This is what I love about Jesus. Jesus, the God of the universe, who is greater than all, th- all people, who is more than humanity, humbled himself, became human, and then humbled himself and went to the cross. And look what it, when he was on the cross, you can read descriptions in the New Testament, but in Isaiah read a, a prophecy of what would happen, and this is a, a reoccurred and re-emphasized in what actually happened to Jesus. But look what it says in Isaiah 52, 14. But many were amazed when they saw him His face was so disfigured he seemed hardly human, and from his appearance one would scarcely know he was a man. So here's the one who's greater than humanity. He became less than human so that I could become all that he created me to be. It should break something in us. It should shift something in us to change the perspective of how we see what we see, how we do what we do, how we give him honor, how we give him praise. To know that the radiant creator of all things breaks something inside of us so that we can have life. Let's pray. God, this morning, it's not an easy one to wrestle with because our pride will harden our hearts. But when we look to you, you, it humbles us. And yet in the midst of our humbleness, you put us firmly where you want us to be. You give us hope and you give us life. And God, we are so grateful that you see us and that you speak to us and that you are the creator of all things. That we can say today that the the lives that we have, the good things that we have, are all blessings from you. They're all because of your glory, because of your honor, because of your word, because of your promises. Lord, I look and I'm so grateful for the family. I'm so grateful for capacity to to think through things and to wrestle with things and to communicate with people. But I know today and I stand here today and I say it's all because of you. It's all a gift of you. And God, together in this place, we come and we worship you. We thank you that you are the creator of our lives. We thank you that you are the sustainer, that you speak to us, that you bring hope, that you bring life, that you bring joy, that you bring peace, that you bring honor, that you've spoken love into the reality of our lives. Come on, can we just thank him for that this morning? Can we give him praise that it needs to be the outflow of what we see, that we see God, you are above all things. We give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory. God, again, it doesn't matter what other people think when they see us. When I know that you are the sustainer of all things in these moments, I'll live that out publicly. Because I need you. 
desperately to understand who you are and what you want to do in our lives. And can I encourage you, if you know Jesus, can you just take this next few moments and just worship him? Come on, right where you're at, just worship him. Just thank him. That's the posture of humility is worship. Just begin to worship him. Call out to him. And while people are doing that, maybe you're here today, though, and today you understand that maybe you're a little bit more like Nebuchadnezzar than you want to admit. There are situations in your life where pride and ego has made you think, I did it, so I'm do it. But today, it is the wake-up call in a sense that you can't do it on your own, but there is a creator and a savior who cares so deeply for you that he wants to bring new life to you. He wants to bring hope to you. And if you're here today and you're saying, you know, I've been trying to think that maybe it was do me. Maybe the suffering has caused me to say I'm do better than what I have. Or maybe my success that I do, I'm do everything that I have. But today, I admit that I need Jesus that Jesus is, is the one who truly puts all things in perspective. And if that's you, I, I, I just want to pray with you. And so can you just put a hand up in the air today that just saying, God, that's me. I want you in my life in this way. I got several in the back, on the balcony, on the main floor. You just put your hand up just saying, God, that's me today. Up in, up, up in the balcony too. Saying, God, today is the day I want to receive you. I need you in my life. And all God says is to be like Nebuchadnezzar, is to pray a prayer like this. And I, I'd love for all of us to pray this prayer because we all need to be in that place of humility. Just say, dear Jesus, I am so grateful that you have called me. You called my name. You put me together. And you gave me all the good things I have. And I admit that today. And today, I renounce my pride. I admit that I have taken credit for things that you've created. But I honor you and I ask you to forgive me and today I choose you. The Bible says when we pray a prayer like that, we just like Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar found God, God restored him, God changed his life when the brokenness happened in his life. And I'm just praying, Lord, this week, will you continue to keep our hearts in a broken state so we can be humble before you, so we can rejoice in you, that we can have empathy and joy and, and companionship and deep relationships with other people, that pride doesn't push us away and bring confusion to our relationships, but, but we can live in humility and draw closer to each other and see God do even greater things.